thanks for coming on the first sunny day in forever in our area. So thanks so much for being here. Um, so I'm here to just chat with you about uh, beginning seed saving. How many of you do any seed saving at all? <coughs> awesome. Great. So this will be, um, hopefully you'll get some tidbits that are additional information for you. And for those of you who haven't participated uh, yet, um, hopefully this will get you engaged. Uh, I probably should say something about myself. I just told uh, her that I would take care of that. So. Robin Kelson, I own the Good Seed Company. I got into seed saving and the Good Seed Company because I feel very strongly about supporting um, our community and reestablishing its practice of selecting, saving, and sharing seeds. That's what our ancestors did. That's why we have the amazing seed supply we have. And it's something that we've kind of let go of. So um, I'm all about helping our communities build resiliency. And that's why uh, and we do that through our own having access to our own seed supply. So. Um, and we somehow have gotten to this idea that it's scary, it's difficult, it's something best left to experts, and the first seed savers had no PhDs and have any higher education at all, and you know, they got us where we are today. So why save seeds? Can somebody tell me why? Uh, why do we think seed saving is important? Go ahead. I had an extra large tomato. Yes. Down. And I was just surprised about it, unless maybe I put one in there. Anyway, it was surprisingly big. Yeah. And so I decided to see some seeds. Awesome. That's great, because you're selecting for traits that you like. That's wonderful. That's a great reason to save seed. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, sure. grow things that are successful here, you know they're going to be successful again, because a lot of the seeds you get come from outside the area, places where they yeah. Grow. Very important, Local, locally adapted seed. We have short seasons. Any of you have been here more than five minutes? No. Late season frost, early season frost, right? End of summer, starting at September 9th. We've had a hard frost a couple years ago. June 10th, hard frost two years ago. I remember those dates well. Um, <laughs> so yes, absolutely. Anybody else? Go ahead. Diversity. Diversity, yes, absolutely. And why is diversity important? Any kind of disease. Resist yeah, disruptive change. Um, the thing that is key to resiliency, that all the successful species that are still on the planet today, the reason they're here is because they've been able to adapt to unexpected disruptive changes. You know, freak, freak winters, freak droughts, long 10-year ten, ten, ten droughts, you know. Yeah. The, the species that can survive those challenges that have the ability to adapt to those crazy changes or an unexpected pest is, uh, those are the ones that do well. So here's the deal. With respect to seeds, in the last 100 years, we have lost over 95% of the diversity of our agriculturally significant crops. And that's just a fact. That's in the US. Um, and it's not good. It's not bad. It's just what is. And I'll tell you why it happens in a minute. But let's just take a second to say, how did we get to the diversity we have today? And the reason we have the diversity we have today of agricultural crops is us, humans. For the last 16,000 years, we have been selecting, saving, and sharing seeds of the plants that we like. So we created the diversity that we, uh, in our current generation and our parents' generation, um, have enjoyed. And we, literally hundreds of thousands of species across the globe has, have been um, uh, created by humans. So the wild carrot, to so the carrots we know and love today, wild corn, wild wheat, wild rice, wild everything, they look like that, okay? Way different from the crops that we know today. And that's through selection, saving, and sharing seeds. Very, very important. Um, and so, and of all those three things, selecting for the traits you like, the big, the big tomato, the plants that do well in our climate, that's selecting for a trait that's important to you, that, that you value. Maybe it's a squash that's stored really, really well. Maybe it's the garlic that made it through April. You know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's the one tomato plant that uh, survived all of the bugs that came into your garden that year. Whatever it is, you selected for a trait that was important to you. So did your ancestors. And those are the traits, those are the valuable seeds that you Right. Now, on top of that, you share those seeds. Of selecting, saving, and sharing, I sometimes think that the sharing is the most important. Um, and the reason why is that it shakes up the DNA a little bit in, um, in your genetics. And it 
allows you to, the diversity of your genetics allows you to maintain a robust, um, healthy selection of characteristics that might protect you against, uh, or not you necessarily, but your plant against that unexpected pest or the, the long drought or the early frost. Um, I, uh, and it, so I tell a story of that, that comes from Will Bonsell out of uh, Vermont. He's a seed saver. He's got the Scatter Seed Project in Vermont. And he tells the story of this little hamlet in Vermont uh, 150 years ago. They all grew one type of corn. And it was called winter, uh, I think it was called midnight lightning, white night lightning corn or something like that. And it did really well in their hamlet. They were in a hollow, so they got, they got uh, late frost. And it was a, slow, a short growing season. And corn is unique because um, the pollen uh, travels for a great long distance. So you want everybody to grow the same kind of corn if you want to maintain that variety. So everybody grew the same type of corn, but they didn't want it to get inbred. Which, you know, anybody who have raises any kinds of animals, you know that inbreeding is a bad idea. You want to be able to mix up the genetics. So around holiday time, let's see, there's two chairs over here if you want to scoot in over here. And mm, I guess, can you, uh, let me, hopefully you can see from there. Anyways, so just very briefly, uh, you know, at holiday time they would go visiting and everybody would come, when they would go visiting, they'd bring an empty mason jar and a bag of the, of the corn seed from their storage. And then when they would, before they would go into the house, they'd go to the barn where the, their neighbor stored their seed and they would drop empty, no, first they would take their empty Jason jar, scoop out um, a jar full of corn and then they'd dump their corn in and then take that jar of corn from the neighbor's house and add it to their storage. And so now everybody had slightly, um, a, a mix of the genetics of the corn from everybody, all the neighbors' houses, and that gave them a nice, uh, and then when they would grow that corn in the summer in their own, in their own uh, pastures, the, the genetics would, would mix a little bit, still all the same type, variety of corn, but now it's like, you know, the blue-eyed, red-headed, and, uh, you know, uh, offspring with a, a, a dark-haired, black-eyed, kid, you know, you're just getting a little variation in there. And it just helps protect the, the stability of that line over time. I guess that's the point. In order to be able to mix up, to do that, you, all, you need to start with a stable line. And that's called an open pollinated um, variety, which means that um, when, when you produce, the, when you grow the, that crop out, the seed that it produces will grow true to type. If you pass that seed on to future generations, that's what we call heirloom. So all heirloom plants are uh, seed, all heirloom seed is open pollinated seed. Um, so why, how did we get to a point where we now have such a, a, low, a much lower variety than we used to have? And it's a couple reasons. Uh, we have a lot of seed companies that have taken over the uh, production of our seeds. So 99% of us buy our seed. And in the last three generations or so primarily, we have, uh, certainly after World War II, our seed companies have focused on uh, the development and sale of what are called hybrid seeds. There's absolutely nothing wrong with hybrid seeds. They're great. That's how we've gotten all of our uh, varieties is that's the, it's the process of mixing two different varieties together and getting progeny. But there's a, there is a methodology to the breeding of it that requires two inbred lines and that, and to produce the, the hybrid seed that you're going to grow out and make and, and eat the crop of. That's delicious. But if you save the seed from the, your crop and try to grow that up, that next generation, which is called an F2 generation, actually, generally speaking, doesn't, you can, it does not reliably grow true to type. So it's not, a, it's not a very good seed for seed saving. You have to actually do a lot of work. It's like when you, if any of you are dog breeders know, you know, imagine breeding a poodle and a Datsun, right? So um, chances are that that first generation of, of puppies is going to be all over the range, right? You can't reliably get the cute mix that you have in your head. It's just they're all going to be, uh, uh, they're going to range. So, that's, so hybrids are not, for, for general uh, uh, seed saving, they're not, they're not reliable seed saving seeds. So, and, um, so there's less, there's more hybrids and less open pollinated seed for s available. 
Um, we have more of those breeders who are patenting their seeds, so now you're actually literally not allowed to save seed from some of these places or some of these varieties. Um, some, of, some of the seed that's being developed, a lot of it, at least commercially, uh, for industrial seed applications is genetically modified, and that's generally not a good idea for seed saving. And then the biggest one really is the consolidation of seed companies. I'm not going to get into this too much, but um, over 90% of our commercial, commercial industrial seed, and by industrial seed I mean the seed that's grown for our commodity crops, uh, that's not only our corn and canola and wheat and uh, cotton seed and soy, it's also tomatoes and uh, sugar beets and potatoes and squashes that go into the processed soups and pasta sauces and all that stuff that we eat as processed food. A lot of that, 90% of that is genetically modified and that's a very, very small uh, variety of seed types. And um, so 90% of that is handled by what are now three three global consolidated companies. And um, when you're a global company and you're trying to grow a ton of seed for uh, at a, a, large, a large quantity of, of companies around the world, you're limiting your focus. You're not spending a lot of time thinking about all those varieties. It's way too complicated for you. And those global seed companies are starting to get into organic seed production. So I guarantee you, at the, at the commercial level and the industrial level, the diversity is going to get narrower and narrower and narrower. And Whitefish, Kalispell, Eureka, Columbia Falls, Flathead Valley is at the bottom of anybody's list is making sure we have a seed supply. So it's up to us to make sure we have our own seed supply, right? We're, we're just not on anybody's radar. We want to grow our, if we want to have good quality food, we have to take responsibility for our seeds. So how do we do that? It is unbelievably easy. First of all, you can do it without me going any further and just see what happens. But a couple of key things. There are just three questions to ask yourselves whenever you want to uh, start saving seeds. And the questions are, are the seeds I'm about to save, uh, I'm about to plant, are they going to produce progeny seed that will grow true to type? Are they open pollinated? That's basically the first question. The second one is, uh, does the plant that's growing from this seed self-pollinate or does it cross-pollinate? And I'm going to walk us through all of this, but these are the three questions you want to ask. So are they what they call selfers or are they crossers? And the third one is, knowing what kind of seed I have, self or crosser, what do I need to consider when I'm planting my garden? Three basic questions. All right, so the first one, will my seed grow true to type? So if it's open pollinated, uh, the answer is yes. If the packet, if you have a packet of commercial seed and it says hybrid or F1 on it, that's a hybrid seed and you cannot reliably trust that the seed you're going to plant uh, would grow true to type if you save the seeds from, th from your product. So just keep that in mind. Um, GMOs, the answer there is no, but, but it's actually a non-issue for gardeners, backyard gardeners. I'll tell you why in a second. Now I want to take a second here and point out because this is a little confusing for some people. You'll notice that the middle packet says organic on it. And some people think if it's organic, it's open pollinated. Those are two very different pieces of information. Organic relates to how the plant was grown. So the person who grew the plant that was this burpee, so burpee grew their cucumbers under organic conditions. And I had to look up the definition because I, I often forget the details of it. So um, organic is produced means it's without conventional pesticides, fertilizers made with synthetic ingredients, or sewage sludge. Also, no bioengineering. That would be genetic mo genetically modified. And no ionizing radiation. So that speaks to the cucumber that was grown by burpee. They grew it under organic conditions. And then they saved the seeds from those uh, cucumbers. But they started with a hybrid seed. So the seeds that are in this packet are going to give you delicious, fabulous tasting cucumbers. By all means, grow them. But if you save the seeds from your cucumbers, you cannot trust that those seeds will produce what you think of as that cucumber called burpees, whatever it's called. I can't see what it's called. Sweet burpee hybrid. OK, so just to keep that in mind, because lots of terms, people get all confused, understandably so, and then we get very nervous about GMOs. So. You, if you're buying a seed packet anywhere, you are just not going to see GMOs in those seed packets, FYI. Okay, so it's not a concern. 
at this point, the genetically modified vegetables and fruits that we are eating are being grown in industrial uh, agriculture for industrial production in processed foods. So for example, and I don't mean to single them out, I'm sorry, but like all the soups, maybe the Campbell soups, they grow all their vegetables. It's easier for them to grow their squash, their potatoes, their tomatoes, their whatever, their carrots, and make it into their soup. And all that stuff is, a lot of that stuff anyways, is GMO. Now, why does, that, why does it matter to us in seed saving? Well, there's two things. Um, in the event that they suddenly do become available, <coughs> for, or you somehow come across some genetically modified seed, it's a, it's a highly uh, inbred line and it's uh, low diversity, and it's also grown, generally speaking, under very, uh, 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 it, it's, it's, it's grown under very uh, easy grow conditions, if you will. And so it's not likely to have the robustness that you're looking for in a locally adapted seed that can handle uh, difficulties. So um, it, should you get your hand on GMO, that's one reason not to grow it. The other reason not to grow it is that, um, the likely ones that you might have access to would be tomatoes, melons, squash, or sweet pepper, should they become available to purchase individually. Those are crops that you might actually save the seeds from. And then you would be actually putting, if you were to save those seeds, you would be putting genetically modified uh, seed into, uh, uh, into the public uh, growing environment. And that's really something you don't want to uh, be responsible for. So. Um, it's it's funda it's it's uh, functionally a non-issue for us, but understand that it's something we would want to avoid, should it become an issue down the road. Um, and again, certified organic heirloom and open pollinated are examples of quality seeds that you know you can um, reliably grow and and get product that you that you recognize as the food you were trying to grow. So. Getting into the details about, um, we're going to move into question number two, which is uh, selfers and crossers. So here's a little picture of a flower, and it's actually a particular type of a flower, but I'm using it as a general example. So the male parts of the flower are these, those two yellow pieces over there that say, the stems that say anthers. That's where the pollen gets formed. And um, in the center, we have the style and the stigma at the top, and it looks like a, a helicopter landing pad. And that is the surface on which pollen grains will land, and it's typically sticky. And the stigma is the female part of the flower. The anthers are the male part of the flower. And when the pollen grains land on the stigma, they travel all the way down to this ovule and the ovary down below. It's just like uh, any other male, female species sex. Same thing happens in plants. Um, and then you've, it fertilizes um, the, the eggs, if you will, in the, in the, or the ovules in the ovary, and, uh, and now you're going to get seed production. Now, in this particular example, this is called a perfect, first it's called a perfect flower because the male and the female parts are in the same flower. An imperfect flower is they're separated but they're on the same plant. And then I think it's called a regular flower, I can't remember. But you'll notice that the anthers are kind of below the stigma and they're, and they're kind of hidden in the uh, petals. It's like the petals provide kind of a shield. And so this is what we would call a self-fertilizing blossom, which means the chances of that pollen um, traveling outside of that blossom are much lower than the majority of that blossom of that pollen landing on that stigma and pollinating that stigma. So this flower is pollinating itself. And these are what we call self-fertilizing. Uh, the plants that have these types of flowers are, we, are what we call self-fertilizing plants. And um, so we call these selfers. And the vegetables that are selfers are beans, peas, lettuces, and members of the nightshades, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. Um, now, I'm, these are general rules of thumb. There are variations to all of this. And if you grow things in a greenhouse where they're you know, really tightly together, you can get cross-pollination. So you know, this is not a Bible. This is not a gospel coming from me. This is just general rules of thumb. But um, the cool thing about sulfurs is that 
you can grow plants fairly near each other and not worry about cross-pollination. So they're really easy plants to grow and save seeds from if you've not done them before and, not get, uh, and get what you're looking for. So, um, okay, and I've put the Latin names up there and I'll tell you why in a minute. So, those are sulfur vegetables. And, um, but, but not all plants are like that. So he, here are a couple plants that are where the male flower, which is the tassel at the top of the corn, is, is far away, if you will, on the plant from the female flower, which is the silk on a developing corn ear. The silk is the stigma that the pollen from the tassel lands on. Um, so that's a, a corn is an example of an imperfect flower. And here we have on the right hand side, we have squash blossoms. And these are two different blossoms from the same plant. If you look at your developing squash vines this summer, if you haven't noticed them so far, check them out this summer. You'll notice just exactly this. You'll have blossoms that just have a straight stem at the bottom. Those are your male flowers. And then you have some blossoms with a little bulb at the end of them. And those are your females with their ovules, I mean their ovaries. So, um, and they're, they're right next to each other all along. The, uh, the vine. Uh, and these are, any example like this is going to be a cross pollinator, right? The pollen has to travel to the female flower. And then you also have, you have different kinds of plants as well where um, actually, uh, I think it's spinach, you have the uh, male flowers are on one plant and the females are on another. There's lots of plants like that. And uh, you have, then you have, uh, these are the brassicas. And here we have, it's a perfect flower, but notice that the anther is way higher than the stem, than the stigma, right? So a lot of that pollen is going to travel beyond that flower. These are cross-pollinating. So all you want to know is there's lots of different ways in nature for that plants have developed to move their pollen. Um, and uh, it, there are lots of different ways that, that they have developed to make sure that some plants really want their pollen to travel far, and some plants want their pollen to stay close. So these are all called cross-pollinators. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, they didn't actually necessarily have to start that way. Corn, original ancient corn, the tassel and the ear were the same, they were the same flower. That separation of flowers is, is as a result of our 10,000 years of developing corn. So um, we can participate in that process of developing cross-hybridization or cross-pollination. Um, so I, I, I take some time to share this about brassicas because I think it's so cool and it's really valuable information. So check this out. Oh, wait, before I do this, let me come here. Let me go to this next slide. So here's, a, some, here's a, some examples of cross-pollinating um, species. And by the way, uh, all of these uh, slides are going to be online at, at the Free the Seed website. So you can download them. So corn, cucumbers. Your melons and different varieties of melons, uh, radish, spinach, squashes, buttercups, different kinds of squashes. Um, they all these are all cross pollinators. Now, the reason I take the time to tell you about the Latin names and to invite you to take the time to learn them is they're so unbelievably helpful, particularly when you're worried about cross pollination. So every for those of you who don't know who have kind of you know viewed the Latin names of plants as uh, annoyance or something to stay away from, uh, they have a value and a purpose. So the, every, it, the Latin botanical name for every species has, starts with one, the first word is capitalized and that's called the genus. And the second word is not capitalized and that's the species. And um, the general rule of thumb is that members of different species will not cross pollinate. So, you know, it's just, it's like, it would be like trying to, you know, mate a cat and a dog. So cats and dogs are two different um, species. And they're, clearly they're just not going to do that for lots of reasons. But um, members of the, the, all, the, all kinds of dogs obviously can crossbreed. So you'll notice that under squash and pumpkins, we've got buttercups. Those are Cucurbita maxima. So buttercups, hubbers, and marrows will cross-pollinate. But uh, butternuts, or acorn squashes, are a different species of squash. And they will not cross-pollinate. So it's just something to keep in mind. And your Latin 
botanical name is a real helpful rule of thumb to help you figure that out. So it's worth knowing that. Um, does that make sense to people? Um, and then, uh, you know, there's some side things and there's some squashes that are actually melons and melons that are actually squashes. So, but I'm going to go back to the brassicas because we grow lots of different brassicas and they're all the same species. So all of these, your collards, your kohlrabi, your broccoli, your uh, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, co uh, kale, whatever else I may be missing, those are all the same species. Those are all one species of plant. So talk about cross-pollinating nightmare if you want to save seed from that. Very, very key. What we did as humans is we just love this plant. And we started selecting and saving for characteristics, you know, that we liked. So the kohlrabi, is, it's actually, um, it was a, a variation that made this fat, round, juicy stem as a bulb. Um, cauliflower and broccoli are variations that made these weird things with the flower buds, and we think that's delicious. And uh, kale and Brussels sprouts are things that happened with leaves that we thought made for really cool tasting plants. So we've developed all these species, and we've taken care to save those seeds carefully to maintain um, reliable production that we know that this seed is going to produce kale, because I want it to produce kale. I don't want it to produce some variation of kale and kohlrabi. Um, but that's going, to, that's going to impact my thinking if I'm going to try to save seed from it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So do you have to grow those isolated to be able to save the seed? So for seed saving, yes. Now, the, I'll get into this later. If you, know, if you want to eat this stuff, all you're going to do is eat, eat it. You can grow them all together. But if you want to save seed, you have to, you have to, this is where you have to do your thinking. And this is where this is, that's why I have us go through these three questions, is now you've got to do some planning. So for me, I, I, I personally, it's too complicated for me. I just grow one variety at a time for seed. You know, that, that way I know I'm not mixing things up. But does that make sense? And then here's another level of crossers. I call these advanced because you have to overwinter these guys. So then you'll notice that a lot of these are roots, not all of them, but a lot of them are roots. So a lot of root vegetables are biennials, which means they don't grow, they don't produce their seed the same year you plant them. Um, there is, so we have annuals that produce the seed the same year, we have perennials that live forever, and we have biennials who produce the seed their second year. And these are seeds that put a lot of energy into a taproot, and we have developed that trait over millennia and made all these delicious vegetables out of it. And so if you think about it, if I'm a plant and I'm going to produce my job, you know, I'm growing food for, for, to eat, but the plant's job is to make seed. So if their job, if they're going to make seed their second year, they're going to store a lot of their energy into that taproot uh, so that they can have energy to put into seed production the second year, flower and seed production. It's very, it's very expensive for a plant to put energy into seed production. So that first year, they're putting all their energy in that taproot. Of course, most of us harvest that, those vegetables that first year and eat the root because it's so delicious. But if you leave that uh, plant in the ground or take care of what you need to to manage the fact that, some, that we live in a colder climate than some of these crops can handle overwintering, the second year, they will put their energy into seed production. So I call them advanced because you, you have to handle a second year. And, there's some issues with that, uh, depending on where you live. So, um, so these are the overwintering ones. Um, but again, if what if I just want to grow this? You know, like so now I've thrown stuff at you about crossing pollinating, and it's like, oh my God, this is so complicated. If you're just growing this for food, you don't have to worry about anything I'm telling you. You just grow it for food and harvest it, because you'll notice if you think about. Think about your cabbage, your kohlrabi, your radish, your, your turnips, your carrots. Does anybody ever see the flowers on those? Right? No. Because you're, you're eating them as a green. You're eating them as a root. You're not, you're not taking it to the flower stage. Um, so you don't, you, don't, you don't actually have to think about this if you're not growing it for seed. Does that make sense? But if you are, we go to the next one. So what do I have to do to consider in planting my garden? So. Um, for 
um, for new seed savers, I really invite people to start with the sulfurs. You don't have to give any special consideration to the plants you're growing. Um, and all you need to do is know when to harvest the seed. And uh, you'll notice that these are all seeds, except with the, with the exception of lettuce, these are generally seeds that you're going to see when you harvest the plant, more or less. And I, what I mean by that is, so, um, right, we eat the bean, we eat the seed when we eat the beans. We eat, uh, we eat the seeds when we eat the peas. Um, sometimes we eat the seeds when we eat the tomatoes. Uh, and the same, you know, the peppers, we see the seeds when we, we harvest peppers, and likewise with the eggplant. Um, now, here's the tricky part, just to, as an FYI. For a lot of the vegetables that we eat, we eat them when the seeds are still green and they're still, they're not ripe yet. So remember, our, our vision of ripeness is for, for, is for edible. And a plant is, their vision of ripeness is when their seed is ready, is, is stable. And that's typically towards the end of the life of the plant. So for corn, which is not on the stable, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned corn. For beans and peas, for example, um, we eat those beans, well, for green beans and peas, we eat them when we're, they're still at what we would call the milk stage, which is when the, the seed is not ripe yet. So if you want to save some seed of your beans and your peas, leave a couple plants untouched. Just leave them until the, the husk is crispy and it's brown and it's like, you know, the whole plant is turning brown. And by that time, you can guarantee that the seed is ripe. And, that's, and, then, and then harvest those. So uh, that's actually what you do if you're, saving, if you're saving dry beans, right? For any of you who save dry beans, that's how you leave them on until the, until the seed is actually ripe. Does that make sense? So that's just one thing to consider, keep in mind. Um, what does the seed need in order to become ripe? And what are your considerations for eating? And so if, if, it, if they're not at the same stage, then leave a couple plants or grow a couple extra plants and just leave them to, to ripen towards the end of the season. Now, tomatoes, when you eat a ripe tomato, we all know how long it takes to get a ripe tomato in Montana, um, those seeds are ripe. So you can just squeeze, as you squeeze the seeds out if you're making tomato sauce or pasta sauce or whatever you might be doing um, and harvest those seeds. Super easy to do. I have some uh, handouts downstairs on how to save uh, harvest uh, tomato seeds. It's unbelievably simple. Uh, there's a very quick and dirty way if you're not doing a whole lot of seed. Uh, you can just spread uh, the seeds out on an index card and let it dry. Just spread them out on the index card and let it dry and then save that index card write the name of the, the variety on the plant, I mean on the container. That's the most important thing is labeling your seeds. Uh, and then just let it dry and, and, uh, and then tear up that index card and plant those seeds next year. That's great if you're only doing like one or two tomatoes. If you're doing anything more than that, that's a ton of seed. Um, very, very quickly, a super easy way is you just put your seeds, squeeze your seeds into a container, little glass jar, add some water, set it aside for three or four days, and the microbes in the air will start to break down that little jelly sack. You know that jelly sack? We all know that jelly sack. It breaks it down, and um, you'll get a little foam of, film of funky stuff. It's a little fungal yeast thing. And just skim that off the top and rinse the seeds, and you'll notice that all the ripe seeds will settle to the bottom very quickly. And decant that couple times. Do just repeat that rinsing of the seeds a couple times. And now you have nice, clean, lovely seeds. And um, empty out the water, spread them out on some wax paper or something that they're not going to stick to because they'll stick to it until they dry. And 24 hours later, uh, put them into an envelope and set them aside for next spring. What I didn't say, and I should have said, and I'll say it again, is every step of the way there, label, 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 label your seeds. I guarantee you, you will forget otherwise. And then, if you're like me, you'll kick yourself. So I want to avoid that. Um, peppers. So if you're eating red peppers, that's the ripe end of a pepper's life. We eat green peppers a lot, and those are unripe peppers. Mm -hmm. So if you want to save a green bell pepper seed, 
leave some on your plant until they turn red. They're going to take a whole long time to do that. But at that point, you'll guarantee that the seed is ripe. So just leave plants on till the end of their life cycle, if you will. Um, eggplant, same thing. And uh, so lettuces. Lettuces is, is uh, what I love about saving lettuce seed are two things. One, they're easy and because they're self-pollinators. <clears throat> and two, when they bolt, that means I'm getting seed. So don't pull all those plants out when they bolt in the middle of July. Leave some and let them go to seed. And, now, and you'll get a ton of seed, ton of seed off of one lettuce plant. Plenty for next year. And you just you don't have to buy your lettuce seed again. It's just done. It's, it couldn't be easier. Um, keep an eye on these because they do have a they have a, a a shell that will open and scatter the seeds. So they 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 scatter seeds. So just as you get closer to the time when the seed pods are starting to turn brown, pay attention. You can either put a bag over the top of the seed bag over the top of the plant or because we live in Montana and it might be getting into frost season, you can pull the whole plant up and turn it upside down so that all the energy of that plant will go into the seeds, and, but put it inside a paper bag so that it, as, they, as the husks open, the seeds will scatter into something you can collect. So pretty simple. Yes, ma'am? Is there a time? I mean, can you keep doing this for years, or will it lose? Great, great question. So I think seeds are far more hardy than we give them credit for, bottom line. Um, if you keep your seeds cool, dry, and dark, away from sun, away from heat, and away from uh, uh, cool, dry, and dark, uh, yeah. moisture, that's the other one, <laughs> that's the other element. <laughs> uh, um, they should maintain viability. Heat, heat will tend to reduce viability more than anything else. And uh, light is second. And, uh, and moisture tells them to start growing. So, um, so as long as you do that, um, you know, I honestly, in my, in my experience, minimum is five years. And I've got, seeds, I've got seeds that's 12 years old. I just did a germination test on them, and I got 95%. I was amazed. So, uh, you know, and there are, we all know the stories of you know, people finding seeds in, in uh, uh, the pyramids, you know, that are 2,000 years old, and they still do great. Now, that's not the general rule for all seeds. And, and alliums, your onions, leeks, carrot, uh, garlic, those tend to uh, have the shortest life in my experience, one to two years, chives, things like that. So um, for a backyard grower, what I say, make sure it cooled dark and dry, key, and um, if you're worried, you know, just plant more. You know, it, it, what, will, what you will see, and if you, were to do, if, you, if you were to do a germination test, or at least what I see when I do germination tests is my viability is high, 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 and then it drops. And it's not like it doesn't go from 95 to 85 to 75 to 65. It's like when they're done, most of them are done. So I can, I'll go from like 95, 85, kind of up there for years, and then it's 65, 50. It's like, wow. So they do have a life to them. Um, I think five is, is easily, for anything except your alliums, five is reasonable for sure. And you can go longer. Go ahead, yes. Is cool above freezing still? Is that, I mean, just below freezing, is that? It, below freezing is not detrimental. Uh, you can freeze your seed. What you, what you want to avoid is moisture. So if you're going to keep them, my suggestion for, so. Uh, all the seed banks, like long-term seed banks, they freeze the seeds. They get all the air out, they vacuum seal them, and then they freeze them. What, you, what the last thing you want to do, so one, two things you, that are not so great is a refrigerator, because it's fairly, it's humid in a refrigerator. And, um, and what you don't want to do is take them in and out of your refrigerator a lot. Because what you're doing when you open them to the air is whatever cool air that's in there is going to uh, uh, become moist. And now you've got beads of water inside your container if it's glass or plastic. So that, that's one thing you don't want to do. Like you can say, I have a big storage of corn seed or something, and I'm going to store it in my freezer because I'm not going to get to it for, that's my long-term storage. Uh, if you can vacuum pack it, great. If not, 
You can put it in glass jars I, with some silica or a bag of rice or something to help pull out any moisture. You really want to get the air out of it if you can. And, um, but don't, don't bring it in and out of moisture. I guess my humidity is key. Am I make sense? Uh, I, you know, I have seeds that do really well that I've kept not part of my seed companies before I had the seed company, but, you know, I just kept them in a, I had a cool cupboard in my house, um, and it, I just kept them inside the cupboard. It was dry, and it was cool, and uh, I had seed that did really well for years. So, any other questions on that? And I can share with you a little bit about germ, germination testing uh, at the end. It's very simple. Um, okay, so... So, you know, here's a picture of a green bean in, uh, at the bottom here. That's when you'd be eating it. Um, this is when you'd be eating a shell bean, but that's, when you want it, that's what you want it to look like if you're going to harvest it for seed. Um, okay. So, now, crossers. This is the key thing. Um, if you're just growing it for leaf and stem production, go ahead, grow them all together. Nobody cares. If you're growing it for fruit harvest, you got to pay attention to um, you, you got to pay attention to the pollination process. So, uh, for example, our squashes we're growing our squashes for to eat, right? And if you don't take care of the pollination cross pollination matter when you're uh, making your squash, you will get uh, cross pollination guaranteed. That's why. You know, have you seen those pictures of, I should have put one of those pictures up, of that huge pile of uh, crazy looking gourds, all those different, you know how there's so many kinds of squashes and nobody even knows all the names of them all? That's because they cross pollinate all the time and everybody gets all these cool, weird looking uh, vegetables. And there's nothing wrong with cross pollinated squashes. Please understand me, absolutely nothing wrong with them. You know, you could go ahead and ignore everything I've just told you and cross pollinate your, all your squashes and just get funky looking squashes. Worst case scenario, you'll get something that pulls out a really bitter uh, attribute and you've got a bad tasting, you know, you've got a bitter squash. Who cares? You just, you know, cook another meal. So, you know, this, you know, you're just like, I'm not going to sell any of that seed next year, you know. But most of the time, they just look pretty weird and funky, but they taste good. You know, and who knows, maybe you've, now you've made a new variety and you save that seed and off you go and you're going to name it after your grandkids. Uh, so please don't, please don't let me be instilling any fear or worry in you. There's nothing harmful coming out of this process. It's just if you're trying to save the lineage, these are the characteristics. Yes, ma'am. Do watermelons cross with squashes? Uh, so I have to look this up because I can't, I my brain. Because one day I tried to hide some water. I didn't want anyone to take my watermelons, so I kept them in with the squashes. And I got some strange looking. Uh, so, um, I, I, a watermelon, I don't have it on this list. So, watermelon is different. I don't have it on this list. So, um, if you look at this, these are your standard, that's a, those are your majority of your melons in the, that white third column, third row. And it's called Kubita mel mellow. And watermelon will not cross with any of those. Um, Martin, do you remember what watermelon species are? I can't. Okay, so they're kind of, they, they're actually fairly unique, you know, so they won't cross with most other things. Well, maybe it just wasn't right, but anyway, I thought it was a pumpkin. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. Watermelon is I kept looking for my watermelons, and I kept looking for them, but then I got to open one of these pumpkins, and it didn't look like a pumpkin. It was solid all the way through. Hmm. How did it taste? Well, it hadn't taste. <laughs> It was white. It didn't look, it didn't have the right color to it. Interesting. Well, you know, give it a try another day. If, she, if that happens again, I invite you to let it ripen and taste it and see if you like it. Yeah. Different color pumpkin soup. Um, yeah, who knows. Um, so, when you come to cross pollination or seeds that cross pollinate, with seeds that whose pollen cross pollinates, um, Things that you need to think about is isolation distances, because now that you've got pollen that's traveling, so two ways that pollen typically travels is either on the wind, goes really, 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 really far, that's corn, and uh, insects. They don't go so far, but they go far enough. 
So corn, just as an FYI, this is why those, that little hamlet in Vermont, they all grew the same corn. Because corn, one, it, the pollen lives pretty long, and two, it's incredibly light and it travels far. So literally, five miles is the distance, is an isolation distance. You want to be separated from other corn if you want to save the corn for seed and you're interested in saving the variety. You don't want any cross-pollination. That's five miles is pretty far. Uh, certainly if you live in Iowa or someplace where you don't have a whole lot of trees uh, between fields. Here in the Flathead, we have lots of barriers to um, that five miles. So that it's actually not so far. You can, you, it's probably more like a mile and a half to two miles, but still something to consider. So um, similarly, yes, ma'am, sir. Uh, how do you prevent cross-pollination with like honeybees? Okay, so this is the thing. So, um, so two things. And well, what, did you have a particular vegetable or fruit in mind? No. Okay. You said that it's like they can go five miles. Yeah. So there's a couple ways to do it. There are things called isolation. So one is isolation distances, far enough away. Two is some kind of a caging mechanism, so that um, this will work certainly for insect pollination if you put a cage around it. Um, I, I've actually not, I have not saved seed from anything where, you know, it was, uh, let me rephrase this. Um, for things where it's wind pollinated like corn, you can't really rely on a cage that, uh, that's permeable to keep that pollen out, right? So you're going to have to work with distances. But if you've got insect pollination like the squashes down here, you can handle that with uh, uh, a cage. So this is an example of a little cage. Um, this is not my picture, but I actually did this this last summer. Uh, and you just build a little a cage around your plants, and you keep and you you put the plants in there, and you put the cage up way before there's any you know way before you're pat, you're at your bloom stage. And um, and then you you. Uh, when you cage things, you want to introduce the pollinators that you want and uh, let them hang out in there, and they will do the pollination that they need to do. And actually, the domestic fly is the best generic pollinator because they really just don't care about anything. They will pollinate anything. And uh, you, you can go you online and buy the larva, and put the larva in the cage, and feed them some molasses and water, and they go nuts, and they live forever, and that's it. Job is done, and you're guaranteed that you're not going to get cross-pollination from outside that cage. Uh, another way is for squash, you hand pollinate. Now, um, uh, so squashes are pollinated by bees, not honeybees, but um, I forget the kind of bees. I don't know if it's mason bees, but anyways, a bunch of different kinds of bees. And um, they actually sleep inside the blossom. This is why people are like, how did the honey, like when did that honey, when did that bee wake up and pollinate that blossom? They actually sleep in that blossom overnight and they're there pollinating that blossom when the sun comes up. So what you need to do is identify the female, the ones with the little bulbs, uh, early before that blossom is not ready to open. It's still kind of greenish. It's not anywhere near ready to open, right? You tape it shut so it can't open. And, uh, and then you, you put some kind of a big marker that this is the, this is the squash you're pollinating because as the plant gets bigger, uh, it's harder to find that plant. You may think early in the season, oh, yeah, I'll, I know where that is. <clears throat> but come August, it's a whole different thing. So anyways, um, tape it shut so that you're in control of when it opens. Wait until it looks like it's about ready to open. It'll change color. It looks like a squash blossom. Go to one of your male pollen uh, containing pollen containing flowers somewhere else like they're up there and use a use your finger use a t toothpick use a q-tip use anything you want to scrape off some of that or you could just pull the anther off and take it in your hand and then um, take the petals off the male and that just leaves the stamen by itself. there you go pull all the petals off your male plant and grab the stamen and and then go to your female flower, open it up, and then uh, brush the stigma with your pollen, and then tape it back up again. So that you're in control 
of when it opened and, and the pollen that got in there, and then you close it back up again. And voila, now you know what pollen went into that uh, uh, developing fruit. And you really want to label that fruit really well so you can find it later, not pick it too early, and now, you've got, now, you, can, now you have seed from that. And you want to leave that squash, uh, I don't know what, it is, what kind of squash it is, but if it's a summer squash that you would normally be eating, you're not going to eat this one. You're going to let it sit until the end of the season as if it were a winter squash. You want to go as far as it can so it gets a hard uh, husk on it, just like it were a winter squash. And, uh, and then you'll know that it's ripe. And then you just uh, you harvest the seed. Uh, actually, pretty similar to the way you harvest uh, the tomato seed, just to make sure you get any kind of, of the wet uh, meat off it. And off you go. They're, you know, pretty simple. And again, if you forget that step and you want to save seed from your squash anyways, go ahead. It'll just be something slightly different. Um, so here's, some, here's a, a list of the considerations for, the diff for some of these crossers. You know, like I said, corn, it's a very far away. It's, a, a high, it's wind pollinated, so you, wind is an issue. 1,000 feet is minimum. One to five miles is more reasonable. Um, I put a mile because of where we live. We don't live in an open uh, valley, but it's, you know, some areas it's up to 500. Now, um, there's another thing here that says dedicated seed saver purest distance. Um, that's, that's where the five mile, I think, comes in. And, um, and that's also, I, I don't know why it says distance, because I'm really, in that column, I'm talking about how many do you need to save? from? How many pl different plants do you need to be collecting from in order to maintain that genetic diversity, that d uh, variability that I talked about at the genetic level? That varies from plant to plant. For our backyard yard, yard growers, I don't think it's a big issue. It's not something to stress out about at all. But I put it in there so you have that information. Um, you know, if you and because just so you know that some plants are more susceptible to inbreeding, what's called inbreeding depression, than others. And corn, because corn, over the course of its history, the corn we eat today is unbelievably inbred compared to its, its uh, parent, parent way back in the day. And so it's pretty susceptible. And if you don't uh, collect from enough different plants to maintain that variability when you grow it out again, you can ultimately um, be harvesting, you know, it's like, it's just like it'd be selecting for the, the German shepherds that all have hip dysplasia, you know, and then uh, over time you're just not going to be able to have a healthy uh, German shepherd line. Same thing. Um, but uh, squash and cucumbers, actually five or six plants, uh, picking squash from five or six different plants is all you need. So it's, it just varies by species and I wouldn't worry about it too much. Yes. So would you do the same thing if you had a fruit tree? Like, I have plum trees, and they're getting pretty old. Yeah. What is the likelihood of that transposing from the seed, from the plum seed? Um, I'm going to actually ask the, the expert here, which is <laughs> Mr. Morris, uh, to answer that question. I have my own thought of it, but he will tell you the correct answer. Uh, the seeds will cross with other plums, and they'll be different, but a lot of plums set up clones, and the clones are true to the original tree, and just dig up one of those clones, and uh, then you'll have the original tree, and just move it wherever you want. Uh, when you dig it up, you want to make sure it has lots of little fine roots on it. Okay. And that'll transplant real easy. So when you say clones, you're saying it's right beside the clones? Yeah, it's right beside it. It could be anywhere from a foot to as far as 10 feet out. And you just dig that up, and as soon as you dig it up, you see it's got fine roots on it. Yeah. You want to put that in a bucket of water immediately. And For like a couple of days until uh, it starts growing roots again? No, just, uh, just so that you don't kill the roots that are already there. And then you just move it to wherever you want and stick it right in. Ah, huh. okay. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Could you graft onto the rootstock, or would that be? You can graft onto that. That's yeah. the grafting guy. Yeah, OK. All right, but there you go. <laughs> Easy peasy. Uh, other questions on what we've covered so far? OK. Is this helpful? Just so I don't, OK, great, great. Um, I have a question. Yes, sir. I saved, uh, I grew some of this uh, blue 
Indian corn big. Oh, yeah. About 12 feet tall. And uh, none of my neighbors grew corn. Yes. So is that corn going to be? Yes. Be yes. Corn? And so that's actually a good thing about this valley is that most people don't grow corn here, you know. <laughs> On the other hand, I do know a guy in Cal well, if you live kind of up here, Kalispell is getting warm enough that people are growing corn. And I do know a guy in Kalispell. Here's another. Here, for, if you want to, if you want to grow corn and save seed, here's an alternative. He grows corn. He loves this variety that he grows, and he loves to save seed from it. So he gives his all his neighbors in his area. He gives them corn. So that and says, just grow this corn, and they all do. So he just doesn't have to worry about it. So that's another way to go. Um, uh, so these are the uh, these are more on the wh what is it that I want to communicate about this? Well, these are just more of the advanced ones. Just some FYI, um, you know. Again, you know, I, I freaked out when I first saw the uh, cauliflower. They suggested that you grow 50 to 100, save seed from 50 to 100 plants. That's a lot of cauliflower. Um, but for the backyard grower, don't worry about it. Frankly, if you can if you can successfully grow over winter and save seed from two or three uh, cauliflower plants, plants you're OK. Um, well, I don't know if I want to get into that. Um, there are a lot of resources online. I think I have this in the next one. I have resources on my website. There's a ton of resources just on the internet. Here's just a sampling of some books that are available. Um, and they will tell you some characteristics about overwintering, these, oh, these overwintering crops. Um, I personally have just, because, because these, bien, these root crops that are biennials, you're technically supposed to harvest them, um, put them in wet sand, keep them at 50 degrees. There are some issues with, you know, and then, and then in the spring, start planting them, put them back into the ground. Uh, what I will say is that it's, what, what is important to do is you want to at least take them out of the ground and see, is this a, is this a carrot I want to save? You know, like, is it forked? Is it solid? Like, what do I want? But if it's good, I have actually just put it back into the ground in September and covered it with a good mulch. And um, they do pretty well. Parsnips, carrots, beets, not so much. They, they have a harder time with this uh, deep winters. And then um, they go to seed the next spring. And that's been just fine. So, and. Um, I might try that with the cabbage first before I go ahead and, and overwinter it. But anywho, the, the wet sand is the other way to go. I don't know if there's another slide. But what I wanted to say, just one last thing. I have a couple. If you want a germination test, a very simple thing to do is you take a paper towel. Uh, you sprinkle your seeds out on the, on the paper towel. If you're you know, doing, if you, if you're required to or you're neurotic, like me, you can you know do them in rows of ten, so you've got a hundred on a sheet. Um, uh, label the paper towel with ink, uh, with a ball, ballpoint pen is the best one, and then spray it with water. Roll it up, put it in a Ziploc bag, push all the air out of the Ziploc bag, zip it shut, label the Ziploc bag, roll it up, put it someplace warm and dark for five days. Come back five days, seven days later, unroll it, and you will see that those seeds have sprouted. And just count, count those little white things that are coming out of the seed. And now you know if you've done 100 and you've got, uh, if, if you've done a row of 10 and nine of them sprouted, you know that it's 90% germination. It's pretty simple to, to do the calculation. And uh, we're at two minutes. So any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Not a question, but a comment. I think it's kind of funny that you're encouraging us all to save our seeds. And you have a seed business where you sell seeds. Yes, this is true. Well, my goal is to go out of business. That is my, my definition of success is that I become obsolete because we're doing it. But in the meantime, you can get seeds from me. Uh, I, sell only open, I sell only seeds that you can save. But I swear to God, that is my purpose, is to become obsolete because the community is taking this job over. Yeah. You, you know, I'm talking about a garden in Indiana rather than here. Yeah. And we normally uh, buy, or I normally buy, uh, uh, seedling tomatoes. Yes, correct. So I won't get the variety I want. Yes. But I never save those. At the same time, um, many seed, many of the tomatoes have, have uh, died in the in the fall, and then they come up as volunteers. Yes. Now the volunteers are always about that big. They're very hardy. They're very prolific, and they're good for canning and and just good for snacking. 
uh, but if I want the nice big early girls for hamburgers, uh, I'm going to buy them. But I, I've never, I've never had early girls come back. Yeah, and, there you go. And. Um, I just wonder, can you actually save those hybrid seeds? So those are going to be difficult for you to save. Uh, those are the ones that, I mean, you can try, but I guarantee you that uh, they're not going to look like early birds when you, early girls, when, when you get those, those fruits the next summer. Mm -hmm. You have to do a lot of work over subsequent generations to mm -hmm. develop an early girl. But here's the other thing about hybrids is just like you said, um, they're, they're grown under pretty cushy conditions. You know, they're, they're really developed by breeders in the laboratory, generally speaking, to get this, because they want you to love that big, fat, juicy tomato, that, cause, and then keep buying the seeds from them. So it doesn't really matter to them that they're not that hardy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the other problem with hybrids. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So go ahead. Well, we're at time, but go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just a real quick one. If you were to grow something like, say, corn uh, in a greenhouse, yeah. would that take care of your crust pollination? It could. You need to grow, so if you're going to grow a small amount of corn, you need to grow it close together. You need to grow, you know, grow it in a block, a square, and then I am always doing this. People say, what are you doing? You need to bang it and get, get it to spread the, colon, co uh, the pollen. You have to really do the work. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, appreciate it. Um, yeah, have a great spring. Thank you.